You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 27, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, chronic urticaria. Our presenter is Dr. Cecilia Wynn. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. and I'm rotating through Allergy Clinic um, this month. And so I will be presenting about chronic urticaria, just a little presentation about it. Okay, so as you know, urticaria is usually these lesions that can be a varying kind of morphology that are raised, erythematous, usually pruritic as well. And they, uh, urticaria is typically due to dilation of the blood vessels and edema in this superficial dermis. And so there's two types. There's acute and chronic. Those are the two main um, divisions with urticaria. And acute, and this is mainly defined by timeline. Acute is usually less than six weeks, and chronic is more than six weeks. Um, another difference between the two is that acute usually is associated with infection, drug, food, or some kind of other allergies. And many times you can kind of elicit from the history some kind of deciding factor um, for acute urticaria. Now, a chronic, the differential can be very varied um, and most of the time idiopathic. Um, acute urticaria can occur in about 20% of the population, while chronic is usually in about 0.5% of the population. Okay, so this is just generally etiologies of urticaria, both acute and chronic. But again, with the definition being um, according to time, with acute usually less than six weeks and chronic is more than six weeks, this can be kind of blurred in some ways. Um, so infections, bacterial, fungal, viral, um, parasitic infections can cause um, urticaria. Now in children, since I'm a pediatric um, resident, with children, um, the viruses that tend to cause acute urticaria are usually like EBV, enterovirus, or um, hepatitis B, according to the tellies. Um, many times you can get some kind of transfusion reactions and um, have hives develop because of that. Or you might sometimes, you know, like acquire an infection, a viral infection like CMV, um, due to transfusion and get urticaria from that as well. Chronic idiopathic urticaria, something that we'll be, I'll be talking a little bit more on, hereditary urticaria, inhalation, um, contact with allergens and beds, um, neoplasm gut, um, that means like food or food um, additive allergy, um, mastocytosis, um, you see that in um, urticaria pigmentosa, and then uh, autoimmune urticaria, physical urticaria, we'll be going into a lot more detail about, and then lupus, carcinoma, or other collagen vascular diseases can also cause urticaria as well. And if you notice, this is the acronym or a little um, trick to remembering all these different etiologies, itching map. Okay, so physical urticaria. There's several different types. First one is cold. And so this is basically um, a response to exposure to cold. And it sometimes can um, result in systemic reactions. So some of these people, if they have these severe reactions to it, they have to avoid like jumping into a swimming pool or a lake because um, they can go into shock sometimes with this. Um, idiopathic cold urticaria is the most common type and it results from pitamine release after exposure to cold. The other types are like cold dependent immunoglobulin disease, delayed cold urticaria, localized cold ur urticaria, and localized cold reflex urticaria. But again, idiopathic is the most common. Okay, so next type is cholinergic urticaria and local heat urticaria. And usually these tend to be papular or macular, like they're little tiny little papules um, that occur in response to heat, exercise, or emotional stress. And you'll see this mainly in teenagers and young adults. Um, so patients can sometimes um, present with hypotension, and this can kind of blur the picture with exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Um, but the difference between the two is that exercise-induced anaphylaxis will not be induced by heat exposure. So if you passively expose someone, a patient to heat and they react and have 
um, hypertension, and that's most likely the cholinergic or local fever to carry down. Um, sometimes these people will have um, autologous um, sweat sensitivity, and this is, will, will be like basal cell degranulation response to their own sweat, which is kind of interesting. Um, next type of physical urticaria is aquagenic, and this, as it's suggested by the name, um, is a response in contact with water. And this is independent of temperature, because you have to be careful with that. Um, so with testing with this aquagenic urticaria, you have to test with different um, temperatures of water to make sure they respond the same to different temperatures. Um, dermatographism. Um, this is pretty um, common, I guess, one of the most common physical types of urticaria. It affects about 2 to 5 percent of the population. Um, and this occurs to kind of firm stroking of the skin. And they'll, patients will present with um, linear wheels that can last about 30 minutes. And they can actually, like, write out names as the um, type of the name suggests. And it might be IgE-mediated, um, as suggested by I guess according to the board review book. Um, solar urticaria is the next type. And this usually occurs like in response to transient light exposure. And it occurs within like one to three minutes. And it's pretty rare. And it occurs mainly in people in the 30s or 40s. Um, so the most common type is um, chronic idiopathic urticaria. And again, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to go through the history, maybe some lab exams as well, um, to make sure that you aren't missing something else. So again, it's a diagnosis exclusion. Um, interestingly enough, um, about in about 20% of these patients, thyroid antibodies will be present. And then they'll have the antithyroid peroxidase more so than the antithyroid galvium antibody. Um, Another thing is that about 30 to 40 percent, as suggested by the board review book, um, just that there, this is an autoimmune disorder. Um, and this is usually an IgG or IgM um, to the kind of the alpha subunit of the IgE receptors. That's the most common. Um, other things to consider. So um, sometimes it's pretty rare, but sometimes people will present with these urticarial lesions when they actually have vasculitis. Um, that's why it's very important when you're evaluating something for urticaria to always ask if they have bruising or some kind of, um, or if they have a lot of pain with these lesions. Because with uh, the vasculitis, um, these lesions will usually last longer than urticaria and they will be more painful um, and less pruritic. So they'll complain, complain of more pain, burning, will have probably maybe have to take some kind of um, pain medication for these lesions. Um, again, sometimes when they resolve, they'll leave purpura, bruising, or hyperpigmentation. So the two types that you see right there are urticarial vasculitis and the hypocomplemented um, urticarial vasculitis syndrome. So with the second thing, you'll have um, associated angioedema, obstructive lung disease, uveitis, and epispleritis. Um, you'll also see in lab values decreased C3, C4, and C1Q, increased ESR, and the presence of anti-C1Q antibodies. So testing. So um, again, it's very important that you elicit a very thorough history when you're evaluating urticaria. That will be your number one, um, I guess, aid when diagnosing urticaria. Um, and it will kind of help you in determining what different lab um, and different testings that you'll pursue. So procedures for different or specific physical urticaria. Cold urticaria, you can do the ice cube test when you kind of apply ice cube for a few minutes and see if they react to that. Aquagenic urticaria, again, tap water at various temperatures. That's the key point is to expose the patient to different um, water at different temperatures. Heat urticaria, um, so you do apply like water test tube test at um, 44 degrees Celsius. Cholinergic urticaria, um, you have the patient exercise for 15 to 20 minutes and see if they have any hives due to that. Um, or you can immerse their legs in, in, in um, 44 degree temperature um, bath. Pressure urticaria, sandbag test, where you kind of, I think commonly it's a little on the shoulders, well, you'll kind of weigh down on their shoulders for, uh, I think it's like 10 to 15 minutes, and then 
remove the sandbags and then kind of see if they have a reaction to that. The sandbag test with pressure over carrier, you can actually have reactions up to like a few hours after the pressure is relieved. Um, so you have to watch them for that in one patient ahead of time um, so you can help with like kind of expectations with treatment for these different areas, areas what they should expect. Dermographism, simply just stroking skin with a narrow object such as a tongue blade um, will elicit some kind of response. Um, lab testing is not particularly helpful unless you have a certain idea of suspecting something. Um, sometimes you can do a TSH, um, again, if you thought they had chronic idiopathic urticaria, so again, 20% of those people will have um, autoantibodies to uh, thyroid. And then other tests that you can do are CDC with differential, if you're looking for some kind of infection, UA, um, ESR, I think in Europe they can do CRPs as well. Um, but these, the lab tests usually are normal in a lot of these patients, so they won't help you out too much unless you have something in mind specifically to search for. Treatment. Um, so again, if you can find any kind of trigger, you and identify it, and it's plausible to eliminate it, then go ahead and counsel the patient on eliminating these triggers. But again, with chronic urticaria, it's just too hard to kind of elicit the uh, inciting factors, and it's usually idiopathic. Um, you can place the patient on H1 antihistamines or H2 receptor antagonists, and sometimes with very severe chronic urticaria, you can have low-dose daily or alternate-date corticosteroids or some kind of other immune modulator. There. Okay, and these are my references. So I mainly use the board review book and then also the tellies. Very good. That was um, great. Yeah. Any questions for Sophia? <coughs> <coughs> it was a total, total adult 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 thing. I think it was because um, they didn't specify in the board review book um, with. Um, for pediatrics, but I think it is more the adult. Yeah, because yeah, Telly didn't mention doing TSH or anything like that. Okay, so in my two years of experience, I found it more common in the adult mm -hmm. than peds. So it's not once, but in adolescent. Mm -hmm. Which adolescents, I never know why they call it. <laughs> adult peds. That's the thing I was going to say. I remember a patient with colon inducer carrier, and I was told to remember to think about like hepatitis C. Oh, were you there? Yeah. Uh, I know in the board review. I, I mean, uh, we talked about. Yeah, I'm trying treatment. to remember what's it called. The cryoglobulins. Cryoglobulins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you yeah. should think about that as another cause for cold disorder area. Like it was a child that we saw, but like for an older patient, if they could have Pepsi with cryoglobulins. Yeah. The. Um, the, I would say the biggest gray area in urticaria is whether to draw labs and sort of shotgun check for things or not. And it used to be that everyone did sort of screening labs, and that's a little bit fading out of style. I mean, they're not very, like you said, they're not very um, helpful. Yeah. But sometimes, especially in older patients, if someone sort of sniffs of having a chronic disease that's undiagnosed, it's worth um, checking in because pretty much any underlying inflammatory process can manifest itself in the heart. So I had a couple more that was in lately because they were like six months old. So I think the same regard if they're like really young, you might want to consider more of a workup because you make sure they don't have like some other like malignancy, like neuroblastoma or some weird thing going on that you may not find other ways. So the thing that I don't see is that you still cultures if there's a history of like travel or you have to have oh, yeah, the test on that kind of stuff. That yeah. Yeah. Right. Like that, that's right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. She was kind of like anaphylaxis, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She ended up. She was a right under the bed. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, you remember her? <laughs> but yeah. But the whole point is, yeah, history is really the key. Find anything you can that's different. Great. Yeah. I'd say your dependence on your slides is much uh, less than most people yeah. at your at your level. So, congrats yeah. on that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production.
To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.